Uh, I was really glad to get invited. Uh, I've been working with uh, on the red team side of things, finding firmware vulnerabilities, and recently switched over to trying to build more secure systems. And it's been uh, a lot of fun to collaborate with folks from uh, Google, Facebook, and Horizon on uh, the Linux boot project. And what we're trying to do is replace the proprietary closed source vendor firmware with uh, Linux. And in a lot of ways, this mirrors the Unix wars of the, uh, the, the 70s and 80s, in which all of the vendors were building proprietary Unices, a lot of times with proprietary CPUs, and trying to uh, compete uh, on their uh, differences. There aren't very many of them left that Linux has really taken over the, uh, the server space. That if you're going to build a server machine, it's probably going to be Linux. And our belief is that this same, uh, this same sort of fundamental uh, change is going to happen in firmware. It's not a new idea. Uh, our colleague, uh, Ron Minnick, started a project called Linux BIOS when he was at Los Alamos back in the 1990s that they wanted to be able to configure uh, these large-scale Linux clusters and were frustrated by the, uh, the BIOS on those systems. So they ported Linux to run in there and uh, built really large-scale clusters. This particular one was number three on the top 500 uh, for, for that year. Linux BIOS was picked up by Google and uh, turned into Core Boot a few years ago and now powers all of the Chromebooks. And if you want a reasonably secure, uh, out-of-the-box laptop, Chromebooks are not a bad choice. They've really done a lot of work with TPMs, with attestation, with a lot of the things that we've been talking about uh, in a uh, ready-to-go package. But if you're on a more conventional platform or a server, you're running something derived from a 30-year-old BIOS or possibly from a 20-year-old UEFI implementation. UEFI is pretty complex, as, as a lot of you know, folks who have worked with it. It's really an entire operating system in its own right. And our belief is that if we're going to have an operating system in the firmware, it should be the one that we trust and the one that we use. And the, the chips are large enough now that we can fit an entire Linux kernel and a small init RD inside the spy flash, uh, which can then use normal Unix tools to uh, uh, find, measure, validate signatures on the real OS. And it can do this from the network, it can do it from the disk, it can do it from any sort of devices that Linux supports. We still need some things to help get the system going, uh, to do the CPU in it and the memory and the uh, interprocessor communication. And for that, we're using something called the firmware support package. On Intel platforms, they provide a binary blob that does that initialization. And uh, Vincent Zimmer from Intel is going to be presenting on uh, the work that they're doing to try to make this more useful for open source firmwares um, after the break. We've been able to use the FSP to get Linux boot up and running on a commodity server main board, the uh, uh, S2600. It has an enormous 64 megabytes of flash. This is just luxury for a firmware developer. Uh, we only need about four megabytes, but if we really wanted to put everything in there, we could. We also support pretty much all of the open compute servers. These are uh, machines where the, the schematics and the bill of materials are published as part of uh, a, an attempt to, to get more OEMs making uh, the systems. Th these are very popular with the hyperscale uh, customers, uh, specifically Google and Facebook are, are big players in there. And the open compute project uh, recognizes that the binary closed source vendor firmware is a, uh, a potential uh, roadblock to having open systems. So at the recent OCP summit, uh, Bill Carter, the CTO, announced the open system firmware project, which currently is in incubation. And we're hoping that uh, sometime soon it will be a requirement for uh, open compute hardware. We've also been adopted by the Linux Foundation, so we can use the Linux TM and the, and the Penguin. And uh, Google uh, hosted a hackathon a few months ago where folks from Facebook, from uh, Verizon to Sigma, and some other places 
came together to port uh, Linux boot to some different platforms. So you might ask, why is, you know, why is uh, someone from a financial service company, why is someone from Google, why is someone from Facebook spending time on this sort of project? And there are really three primary reasons, the security, the flexibility, and the resiliency. And this has been the topic of a lot of the talks uh, so far. But let's, let's start with security, because that's, that's uh, what we're here to talk about. One thing that Linux boot lets us do is minimize the attack surface. You might say, well, Linux is a huge TCB in its own right, so let's, let's just say we can reduce the attack surface. If we go back to that UEFI slide, this, uh, the, the Dixie phase loads these uh, device, bus, and service drivers, and there are a lot of them. On the S2600, there are 480 modules uh, in, in the Dixie phase that, that it loads. Um, they do things like load UEFI option ROMs, which uh, even with signatures, there's still some potential issues. Without signatures, it's, a, uh, it's just incredibly dangerous to take code from an external device and run it in ring zero during the boot process. Um, uh, John Heisman demonstrated this in 2007. Uh, my Thunderstrike talks showed how this can also be used against uh, uh, systems with uh, Thunderbolt. Other modules in Dixie will process images and display them on screen. Uh, there have been multiple uh, Black Hat talks about uh, vulnerabilities found in bitmap parsers. So you know, this is another good place to go looking for bugs. There are things for legacy uh, OSs that you know, specific vendors need in there um, that we don't need in our, in our legacy-free environment. There's a complete network stack. Um, and there, there'll be a talk at uh, Black Hat um, 2018 coming up in a few months uh, showing a remote exploit vulnerability against that stack. There's also lots of legacy device drivers. Uh, you might remember from two years ago, Zen had a, uh, a hypervisor escape due to a buggy uh, floppy emulation where no one had tested that code in, in, in decades. And speaking of uh, legacy you know, dusty corners. When do you think the last time this code was tested and the interactions were, were really experimented with? You know, there's lots, lots of places in here that just haven't seen, um, that are no longer necessary. Another part of the UEFI boot process is this final OS bootloader. And Grub is not part of UEFI, but it's typically invoked here. And it doesn't look like much, but it's its own operating system as well. Uh, it has file system, video, network device drivers. All total, it's about a quarter million lines of code. And you know, if we're going to ha have an entire OS in there, uh, rather than having three, where now we have to worry about bugs in each of them, our argument is that we should have the one that is under the most active development, and that's probably already in our TCB, that we're running Linux on our servers, we're dependent on its security, we should depend on its security in our firmware as well. Uh, apologies to some of the vendors here, but we don't trust you. <laughs> you know, we can't trust nobody. Uh, Intel, we don't want to trust you, but we kind of have to. Um, in Grub, yeah, you could definitely reduce Grub. It's because we have the source to Grub. We can do that. Um, so some vendors have really betrayed our trust and have put things in the firmware that reinstalls effectively malware uh, when the system reboots. Um, we also know that uh, uh, black hat groups are selling UEFI vulnerabilities uh, to uh, government agencies, um, some of which maybe you're purchasers of those. Who knows? Um, and even when those vulnerabilities are found, the path to getting them fixed and deployed in uh, end user systems is very long, and frequently it never happens. Uh, most OEMs, uh, as Lenovo pointed out in their presentation, uh, only have control about 10% of the BIOS code. Most of the rest of it, they're getting from these IBVs or the, the o ODMs. And this means that a vulnerability has to, usually has to get fixed by Intel, picked up by the IBV and tested, uh, integrated by the device manufacturer, uh, and then ported by the uh, OEM to whatever platforms. 
they typically only have a financial incentive to do that for their current platforms. Um, very few vendors are going back and fixing uh, things that they're no longer selling, which means that uh, if you don't have the ability to fix problems yourself, th these are going to turn into forever day bugs. So uh, during the Dell talk, we were told we should trust but verify. And I think we can only trust what we can verify, that uh, if we can't see the code, it becomes very difficult uh, to trust it. In the case of Linux boot, and Linux and uh, the, the open source tools that we build on, this code is visible. Everyone can see it. The Linux boot code, uh, every commit is PGP signed. So even if someone tries to attack the source code control system, we can uh, hopefully detect that. We also ensure that all of the builds are, re are reproducible. So we don't need a golden build server. Uh, anyone who checks out the tree should be able to get a bit for bit identical executable uh, when, they, when they build a, uh, a known configuration. And uh, we have part of our continuous integration test in sh uh, checks that no matter what Linux you build on, uh, you will get a identical ROM. <coughs> the other thing that open source gives us is the ability to be far more flexible in, in our system. Um, as uh, Ron Minnick pointed out at the OCP summit, this turns all of your Linux developers into firmware engineers that you don't have to uh, you know, work in the UEFI space. You can work with the tools that you're already working with. So the, the startup is familiar shell, shell scripts, or if you're from Google, uh, Go. <laughs> uh, you, know, you, can, you can configure the system with the, the same kconfig that, uh, that you already use. And this allows you to tailor uh, the file systems that are supported. That if you want to boot from a Lux encrypted volume, you can do that because we have those tools in the firmware. If you want to disable uh, network or USB or other things in the firmware, you can turn that off to tailor it uh, for your threat model. Because as uh, Steph says in, in her uh, training classes, your threat model is not my threat model. Uh, and the ability to adapt the software you know, is really uh, critical, um, especially in a group like this that is focused on platform security. So we have a few different runtimes that are supported as well. Uh, the one that I've been developing is called Heads, and it's uh, designed mostly for laptops. It uses the TPM and the hardware uh, functions to be able to start cubes or other uh, Zen-based systems. Uh, and it can do it in a legacy-free way making those uh, fairly strong security guarantees. Uh, the uh, Google group uh, is working on their own firmware that's based, or excuse me, their own uh, runtime for Linux boot uh, that's written in Go. And one of the things that it has done is that has sped up their boot time from about eight minutes down to about 20 seconds. Um, and a lot of that comes from things in, in the, uh, uh, the, the vendor firmware uh, doing things serially. You know, if you have a uh, four-port NIC, it does DHCP on each one and times out. And so there's you know, two minutes of your, of your boot uh, just, uh, just wasted. The Facebook group uh, has been experimenting with porting Linux boot to uh, some other uh, platforms, uh, notably the S100 uh, Wedge switch. And on this system, they were able to reduce the boot time to about eight seconds and uh, down from, I think, about six minutes, which if you're running a five nines operation, a six minute switch downtime basically is uh, your entire year's worth of downtime. So they can now uh, adjust switch configurations and reboot um, and not uh, burn through all that, uh, uh, that downtime. The resiliency that we get from, from Linux boot and uh, from using open source is also a, a really key feature. Um, as uh, Matthew Garrett pointed out, there's, with most systems, we don't have a good way to guarantee that uh, the, uh, the software asking for your password, you know, that's been loaded by a kernel, that's been launched by a bootloader, you know, that, whole, that, that long chain of trust is hard to maintain uh, with, with a lot of the proprietary firmwares. Um, but since we control that root of trust, we can measure everything, and we can do it statically, and we can have a fairly short chain. Um, so we, we make extensive use of the TPMs on platforms that have them. 
on laptops, we can do a essentially a remote attestation to the user that their firmware is unmodified. So in this case, uh, this is another Matthew Garrett idea. The, uh, the TPM unseals a secret, a shared secret, and computes a hash of that based on the current time. And the user can then verify on their external device that uh, they get that same secret. Um, this is useful because we can't do RSA in our heads. But, um, and uh, it's also been recommended by uh, the EFF uh, for when you're crossing borders and dealing with government agencies that might be interested in your hardware, this is a good way to try to have some faith that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, computers, however, can do RSA in their head, so uh, they can do remote attestation. We've been collaborating with the Massachusetts Open Cloud Project, uh, which is uh, MIT, Lincoln Labs, and Boston University and Air Force Research Lab, and they've developed a uh, system called Keylime that allows cloud servers to attest to their firmware uh, prior to going into the provisioning stage. Um, this is really important for a bare metal cloud system where you're worried about uh, pre pri previous tenants perhaps uh, modifying your, your uh, firmware. So we say measure everything, but you know, as, as uh, Johanna pointed out in her CCC talk a few years ago, there is a lot of mutable state out there. Um, you know, the, the, the NICs have state, the GPUs have state, the SSDs have state, power supplies have state, and uh, that photo is actually from a project I was working on that was able to get code execution in a BMC over the, uh, the PM bus. So, you know, keep track of where you get your, buy your power supplies from. Uh, as Jim mentioned on the, uh, uh, the NIST 800-193, has recognized that all of this mutable state is a big concern for building a secure platform. So we've been also uh, looking at that document and trying to figure out how do, we, uh, how do we ensure that we can meet those guidelines with open source software. There's nothing secret in meeting the guidelines, so there's nothing that would preclude us from being able to do that. One of the other goals of 193 is uh, preventing persistence. Um, if you are building custom hardware like the, uh, the HP module, or um, uh, if you're Google, uh, you can build something like the Titan. Uh, John will be presenting on that uh, tomorrow. Uh, on more commodity hardware, we've been working with uh, reverse engineered boot guard documents. Um, uh, Alex Matrosovov uh, at Zero Nights gave a really great presentation, which is currently all that is publicly known. Uh, I'm hoping that Intel will release more details and uh, so that we can better understand it. Um, since we have all of Linux uh, and we're dealing with more commodity hardware, we can integrate things like uh, uh, YubiKey HSMs or Nitro Keys. And we have GPG in, in the ROM, so we, can, we don't need uh, the UEFI trusted boot. We can do even better. We can do you know, PGP boots. We can do... Uh, uh, use that to sign our firmware, excuse me, sign our, our hypervisor and, and our initial RAM disks with the tools that we're already using. And we can also uh, integrate that into things like DM Verity, which will let us do a read-only root file system. So we can have, uh, you know, a root of trust from that, from that hardware transfer to a PGP uh, signature, um, PGP public key that's in the ROM, and then use that to verify uh, the, the entire OS as we're running. We can hand that off to an OS like Cubes. Um, I'd love to work on getting OpenXT to work with this as well. Um, and uh, Cubes has some additional support to help uh, detect uh, firmware attacks, and uh, Brendan will be giving a talk about that tomorrow. Uh, we've been really concerned about system management mode. Um, uh, Intel ATR gave a great talk at uh, uh, DEF CON a few years ago, which I don't have a good photo, sorry, um, that uh, was a, uh, that, that showed how SMM can escalate out uh, for a hypervisor break. One of the ideas that we're experimenting with is basically doing away with SMM and moving those SMI handlers uh, into, the, uh, uh, into Linux or into the DOM0 uh, kernel. So that way we're not stuck writing either 16-bit real mode or trying to interface with um, 
uh, with the, the limited environment there. Um, the management engine has been a big concern. Um, uh, John said, mentioned uh, some, some of the concerns about that. You know, it's, it's plugged into a lot of different parts of the system. Um, and it's had some remotely accessible vulnerabilities that because it's closed, because it's not, uh, it, you know, it's not visible to, uh, to us, it's hard to find these things. That, this was a, uh, this particular one was a stir in comp um, that you could log in with an empty password. It was, you know, hopefully would have been caught much earlier if there had been more eyes on it. Uh, I, I did a bunch of research back in 2016 uh, to figure out how to turn off the management engine. Um, and uh, Nicola uh, Corna has produced a, a tool called the ME Cleaner that allows that to be done on, on systems. Um, so this is something that we've incorporated into the, uh, into the Linux boot process for, for folks who want to uh, take advantage of it. The other place on the servers that we're really concerned is the board management uh, controller, which uh, is yet another CPU, and it has DMA access over PCIe. It's hooked up to the network. It can see the VGA. It, it talks to the power supply. It's on the USB. It can man the middle of the serial port. It, a lot of them can talk to the spy bus, and a lot of them can talk to the TPM. So this is basically, if you can get code execution on uh, the BMC, you're pretty well in good shape. Uh, Facebook realized this was a big problem, and they've launched an open source project called OpenBMC, and uh, have a lot of the open compute hardware working with it, um, including the, uh, the new uh, Monolake boards. These are these are particularly interesting because one BMC is controlling four uh, nodes. So if you can get code execution on the BMC, this gives you a way to move horizontally uh, uh, through the infrastructure. So if you want to get started with Linux boot, um, unlike a lot of the things that have been presented here today, you can download it from GitHub. You, you can check it out, you can build it, and you'd better get the same binary that we get when we build it because, because of the reproducible builds. You can experiment with it uh, with a QMU, um, and when you want to start playing with it on real hardware, you'll have to break out your Flash programmer. You'll probably get pretty tired of swapping out um, uh, uh, the ZIF sockets. There, since we are supporting the open compute hardware, um, it's, that's one way if you want to build infrastructure built on it today. Um, Horizon will sell you racks of, uh, of nodes, and you can, um, you, you can build your infrastructure on this, uh, this open source boot process you know, from, from the reset vector all the way to, to the application. So that's the really fast overview of how we think we can build a more secure, more flexible, more resilient system with open source, with reproducible builds, and with this static root of trust. So love to answer any questions you all might have about Linux boot, and uh, uh, thanks so much for, for coming today. Sounds that it is not possible today uh, to uh, code it on Linux boot on this platform because they are protected by uh, signing mechanism. Uh, so, as I understand correctly, this kind may run on uh, open source platforms or something like that. How do you, uh, how do you like code that? Like or are you going to, to cooperate with uh, major vendors like their HP? So the question is, uh, how do we reconcile this vision with what uh, the vendors have been doing to lock down the platform? Um, so uh, one, one thing that we really want to find are some OEMs who are interested in uh, producing more secure systems. Um, we've, we would love to uh, work with them to, uh, to help support Linux boot. Um, uh, it's my belief that uh, in a few years all these systems will be Linux boot and that, that's just the inevitable uh, conclusion. Um, uh, at least that's my dream. Um, the, uh, you know, I think pressure from security conscious customers is one way to make that happen. Um, on some platforms, uh, their boot guard implementations are not good and you can, uh, you can bypass them. Um, some, some of them have rollback prevention, some of them don't. So uh, 
you know, once you get one break, that they'll let you keep going. Um, some platforms are not turning on boot card. Um, the uh, the Librem laptops, for instance, uh, uh, deliberately leave uh, boot card unfused so that when you receive the laptop, you can fuse your own uh, keys in, into the PCH, or excuse me, uh, into the uh, the management engine. Um, but uh, beyond that, on the server platform, um, Vincent's going to be talking about the uh, the Min platform project out of Intel, which is a has a goal of allowing people to build uh, relatively open source uh, firmwares for their uh, for their servers. Um, so I was going to say, you said uh, you could play with it using Keen. Um, have you boot, you know, can you boot Zen VMs with it? Uh, I believe so. Um, there, I haven't actually booted it all the way into the VM, but I've made. Sh I, I use that to make sure that Zen can start up. Um, there were some. Uh, there were some issues that where Zen had some legacy dependencies, uh, but we have pushed those fixes upstream already. Well, <coughs> looking back at the history of the Linux kernel, I think one of the things that made big changes were when the Linux kernel was functionally capable enough for the things that customers cared about. And so I guess the question is, are there any major capabilities that Linux Boot doesn't have yet that some of the other <coughs> products do that once added, I mean, you don't have to have functional equivalents, just the ones that matter. Right, it, and there's a lot of places in the firmware where you know people don't probably don't use them anymore. You know, right. Things like the floppy driver. Right. There's Probably a, not a problem. Yes. So are yeah. there any major capabilities that you would expect once they're added, you would be feature parity enough that for most customers, uh, they don't care? So it, on, quite, it doesn't make much sense for HP and Dell to spend lots and lots and lots of money to do what you've already got. Right, right. And the, for the, the proposition for the vendors is they can leverage a lot of the work being done in the community that it doesn't necessarily make sense for uh, the HPs and the Dells to be writing yet another um, Ethernet device driver if the Linux kernel already has one that's probably seen uh, a billion times more packets uh, flow through it. Um, you know, if they can, they can get a huge amount of leverage off uh, f from the Linux community um, and then they might only have to contribute a small amount to interface with, with their boards are there any major kicking missing capabilities that you see right now? Uh, so right now, on we have uh, uh, we don't have uh, TPM two, um, but that's a limitation of our software stack. Um, we don't have a great uh, solution for things like uh, VGA option ROMs. Um, so on systems that have uh, the i nine fifteen card, we can do native in it. But if you have some something that does require an option ROM, we're currently not executing it. Um, we are able to leverage uh, uh, retaining. We, we can run some D, uh, Dixie modules under the Linux kernel as well, and we're exploring whether or not we can do that in a uh, in a way for where some some customers, some sites, have uh, custom Dixie modules that they want to run. Um, and we can run, potentially run those under the Linux kernel instead. Oh, that's true. We, we can't boot um, uh, legacy OSs. We can only boot uh, multi-boot and BZ image uh, kernels. So the, the the roots are so the question is what's the difference between core boot, Libre boot, and Linux boot? The roots are the same in that um, uh, Ron Minnick sort of started all the projects, uh, or started. So uh, core boot, Lib Libre boot is a fork of core boot that has all of the uh, that has uh, no binary blobs in it. So it only supports platforms that uh, have can be initialized without any proprietary code. Uh, Coreboot works with systems that um, uh, that 
where you might need a binary blob for, say, the VGA option ROM or some other ones. Um, but it provides the uh, um, sort of the framework that, that they run in. Uh, right now with Linux boot, we're, we, can, we can be started as a core boot payload, uh, or we can take over from the, uh, from the Intel FSP um, and sort of the, 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 the PEI phase. So we have enough of a wrapper to be started as um, basically as the Dixie core in the UEFI uh, model. In the previous talk, we were kind of warned of, of software monocultures. Uh, and that seems to be what you're advocating for here. Do you think that the benefits of Linux boot outweigh the threats of the monoculture? I absolutely believe they do. That the, especially when it comes to uh, the, the quality of the code and the amount of exposure to testing, uh, real world testing that the code has had, that the, the Linux kernel has had. You know, is exposed on the internet and has uh, uh, so many people trying to attack the network stack and uh, fuzzing the file systems and just in general trying to uh, f find vulnerabilities. Um, on the, uh, the GitHub slide, you know, it has uh, an infinite number of contributors, um, most of whom you know, found some sort of vulnerability or some sort of bug that they needed fixed. Um, and as a result, it is much more responsive to, uh, to these sorts of problems uh, when, when, when they're discovered. Um, you know, the, uh, so it, is, it does give us a bit of a monoculture, but it helps us avoid the weakest link uh, problem, where if you have UEFI loading Grub and then Grub loading Linux, if you can find a, a vulnerability in any of those three, uh, you can get in. So you only have to find... Uh, the, the weakest link in that chain. I would add to that that only the Linux kernel itself there is the mono thing. Like we have multiple runtimes that you can use with Linux boot. You can write your own, right? Um, so the actual applications, bootloaders, and stuff like that uh, are now have more choice than you did before. It's not. Is now weakening in the environment because we're just going from one monoculture to another. We're going from the UA by monoculture to a lens group, which is a much more, from pointing out, a much more vetted uh, monoculture than UA by a small might be. Monoculture is mitigated by the open source and the size of the community that participates, it's not eliminated. Does the support only care except for multiple starting for even parallel or something like that? So the, uh, the question is, uh, do we only support KXEC kernels? And uh, that, that's the typical model is that it'll, they'll KXEC, but not all ap applications necessarily need to do that. Um, that if you have a system that, uh, where you're very, very concerned about startup time, you might not want to KXEC. You might actually want to bundle your application uh, into that initial uh, RAM disk. And then you could run uh, with, with everything you know, uh, just out of, uh, out, out of that ROM. Um, and that would give you a very, very fast boot time. Right now, we, we don't have any that are supported, but uh, there's discussion about um, uh, doing this on power and on ARM. Uh, Power actually does something like this are very similar. Um, the Opal uh, bootloader is a Linux kernel that then KXX the, uh, the real uh, bootloader, or excuse me, the KXX the real kernel. Um, on ARM, the, uh, we can definitely fit into, into that model. Uh, the ARM initialization right now is a lot simpler, um, but uh, uh, we, and we've done some work with, with just starting the, the Linux boot kernel and runtime from, from U-Root. That, that, that works just as well. Or excuse me, from U-Boot. Do you have a story for um, flashing updates and protecting the flash? So uh, we do. We've, uh, we're testing with uh, ChipSec for uh, platform um, security. And 
the typical model, um, well, let's also, let me back up and say, we're, we're providing a toolbox uh, you know, in the classic mechanism, not policy. So uh, a site can write their own uh, platform protection based on what they need. Um, so if you want to uh, require a firmware update to come from an operator on the serial console or via some sort of physical presence detection, uh, that is doable uh, in this model. Um, when the Linux boot kernel takes over, the platform is unlocked, so the flash is, the flash is open, uh, SMM is not yet uh, locked, and then we can install those handlers, we can uh, set up those, those lock bits uh, prior to handing over to the, uh, either to the user or to the, uh, uh, the application kernel. Um, and in terms of doing updates, uh, that, again, is a policy question. Um, if you want to validate PGP signatures, if you want to only accept them over certain media, you know, it's a, it's a very small shell script to make that, uh, to implement that policy. I think something like Linux Group could also be used to replace CBIOS in virtualized environments to increase the time. Possibly. Uh, the, uh, the, the question is, uh, can we, could we use Linux boot in a, in a VM environment? Um, I think uh, either the, uh, something like Linux boot could potentially do it. There's also a neat project out of, called the uh, Mirage uh, OS that is trying to do like really fast, like uh, tens of milliseconds to start up. Um, uh, in general, uh, being able to because the, the Linux boot build is so small, uh, it actually works really nicely in those sorts of uh, self-contained VMs. So if you want to spin up a VM that's just going to do IP routing, you don't need a multi-hundred megabyte uh, sort of thing. You know, this, this fits in four megs. It's, uh, it, it's a pretty compact package. Um, when I buy you know, a board and a couple of peripherals off the shelf today, I expect to plug them together and have them work. Um, if we're customizing firmware to include, say, you know, only the drivers for the hardware that is intended to be there, um, there's, like, there's like a change to the provisioning model. Right? I, I need to know what parts I'm going to put in my computer sooner than I used to need to know that. Possibly. Do you need them to boot? If you don't need those devices to boot, and if you don't need those devices to perform your attestation or, or whatever other uh, provisioning process, then you don't need the device drivers in the, uh, the Linux boot kernel. Um, in fact, that's one, one way of limiting the, uh, uh, the attack surface is if you don't need USB uh, so that you know, in, in your server uh, during the boot process, don't turn it on. That way you, someone people plugging in malicious devices wouldn't be able to subvert the boot process. Um, so likewise, if, you know, if, if there's a device that you do need, then you would have to build a custom kernel uh, with that, uh, or um, modules for, for that device. You mentioned that you support uh, disabling uh, management engine as part of Linux. Can you comment on to what extent it can be disabled? So there are uh, two mechanisms that we, we use. One is the, uh, the high assurance platform bit, the HAP bit, uh, which is a officially supported mechanism for it. Um, the other is a, uh, for government customers who knew about it. Um, the other way that we uh, disable it is due to uh, lazy evaluation, due to the fact that it does lazy evaluation of the, uh, of the signatures and the hashes. So it would perform enough we could leave enough of the firmware in place for it to validate the signatures, start up the CPU, and then uh, it would halt when it, when it hit a uh, signature uh, error. Um, I think you could uh, <laughs> travel directly. I'm sure there's lots of possible things to talk about. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you.